All right, so it is our last part of this amazing series on building a specialty lens practice. I'm super excited to be here with Dr. Katie Morrison. And um, Katie and I have actually uh, been on this journey together and uh, we were connected kind of at the, around the same time that we had this idea of starting this kind of cash model clinic, basically focusing on specialty lenses. And, and it's been really such a, such a pleasure just being able to bounce ideas off of you, Dr. Morrison, and just kind of going in, down this path together and having somebody that we can, we can chat with. So it's been, been awesome. And I just wanted to let the audience know a little bit more about you. So Dr. Morrison graduated from the New England College of Optometry in Boston. And then she completed a cornea and contact lens residency at SUNY College of Optometry, and that is in New York City. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and a fellow of the Scleral Lens Society. She is a frequent lecturer, writer, and industry consultant in a variety of topics, of course, many of them with specialty lenses. And then prior to starting her clinic in Arizona, she actually worked in the cornea department of New York Eye and Ear in Manhattan, which specialized in corneal diseases and complications. And Dr. Morrison has such an incredible story of how she moved from New York and, and, and wanted to start this kind of cash model clinic in Scottsdale. And uh, like I said, we were, we've were we been kind of on this journey together and it's been really, really fun just learning from you. Um, you know, you're about to have a baby that just goes to show how committed you are to, to this industry and just to getting this information to our colleagues. It means so much to me that you would, you would join us today and, and, and share your story. So thank you so much, Dr. Morrison, and uh, super excited to learn from you. All right. Thanks, Dr. Wu. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I see that we have about 275 people, which is awesome. I'm so excited. Um, yes, uh, Dr. Wu and I started our practices around the same time. Um, I actually moved out to Arizona from New York, was going to had every intention of kind of joining a practice and then starting up my own practice a little bit later when I knew the, the area, the doctors better. Um, but just, I've found that there wasn't um, as many people as I thought doing this. And, and a lot of the practices didn't want to do specialty lenses. And so I just ended up opening um, a practice on my own and uh, it's been going really well. It's awesome. Get to see exactly um, the cool cases that I've always loved to see. And um, I'm really happy that I get to talk with you about, you know, how do you implement all these things you've heard today you know, you're doing specialty lenses in your practice, you've gotten everything done um, in terms of equipment, uh, et cetera. But how do you actually train your staff and get your practice up and running to, uh, to take care of these patients? All right. Um, and then, yeah, feel free to ask questions. Um, we'll try to get to as many as possible at the end. Um, and then, you know, we, uh, all of us on this panel really love talking about specialty lenses. And we also love talking about, I think the business side of things is really interesting. If you're running a clinic, if you're in a clinic and you're trying to start something, something new, um, you know, we've tried uh, a lot by talking to each other and then a lot by trial and error. And we're still learning every, every year we drop things, we do things differently. So, um, this is how I got um, my staff and myself uh, just organized in order to implement specialty lenses for patients. So the objectives of today are basically how do you train your staff um, and yourself to really communicate what you're doing in terms of specialty contact lenses? Um, what verbiage and ter uh, terminology can you use in order to communicate value to your patients? Um, what should your staff help with? What can they help with? Short answer, anything you want them to. It just takes time to train them. Um, and then some, some really uh, concrete pearls for phone etiquette and uh, training that I've been doing over the past, um, over the past couple of years uh, that's been, been really helpful. So yay, you're offering specialty lenses. You're excited. You have your fitting set in the office. You're ready to start going. Um, now what? What do you do? 
Um, so the first thing is get the word out. As uh, the other docs mentioned, um, getting the word out to different providers in the area, getting the word out on your social media, getting the word out on your Instagram, Facebook, um, your Google My Business, which is an awesome tool to use um, and pretty underutilized tool. Um, getting the word out via SEO, et cetera. But also when you're doing that and sharing with your patients, oh, we're offering this new uh, service, um, also share it with your staff because you never want to have a patient call in for a prosthetic contact lens and your staff is like, what? Oh, I don't, I don't know anything about that, um, which hopefully they wouldn't do, but, and they would just fake it till you make it. But um, get the word out to your staff first and then you can kind of put the word out um, online, et cetera. And um, who do you share this with? As you've seen from every one of our presentations, all your patients. So new patients that are coming in, um, patients that you already have. Um, I always ask all patients who come in, even if they're co just comprehensive. I don't do as many comprehensive exams as I used to because the specialty lenses is really taking over um, my practice. But when I do see comprehensive patients, I do say, do you wear contacts? Do you want to wear contacts? A lot of times patients will say, I mean, I would say maybe like four times out of 10, oh, I used to wear contacts, but I don't really like them. Um, and you can say, oh, well, there's a lot of new things. Why did you not like them, et cetera. Um, and even offer those like soft specialty lens services. So yeah, getting the word out to all of your patients, not just new ones, not just people who have keratoconus, but everybody. And um, communicating all of this with your staff so that you can have a really smooth transition in your practice. Um, staff is really, really important um, to the success of your practice. Um, specialty lenses are an amazing thing to offer. We have all seen how life-changing it can be for your patients, but they're, comp they're complex. Um, you know, knowing about the different uh, facets of the lens, what's the difference between a GP and a scleral? Um, what do patients who are coming in for uh, pediatric aphakic contact lenses, what are they looking for? What do they need? What type of exam? How long does it take? Um, these patients are going to, you know, take more time, more energy, more uh, just just more of your mental energy as well. And um, so for to have your staff be able to schedule appropriately, um, that's really, you know, imp important. Um, at my practice, um, because Stephanie and I have a, uh, have a similar practice, um, we each, I think, a lot about an hour for an exam. And that's been really helpful for specialty patients. But for my consultations for a first time patient, just because we talk so much, I do do an hour and a half. Um, if you run a really busy practice already and you're implementing specialty lenses, that's, that's not for you. That's not for you. Um, but having the availability to say like Dr. Fergozo was, was saying, we're going to do this today and then we're going to have you back for X, Y, Z. Um, and having your staff be able to implement that and uh, discuss that with the patient. So, oh, you're going to, this is what you're going to be seen for today. We might need to do a little bit of extra um, something extra in the future, but you know, you can, we'll talk about that when you come in for your, for your consultation. Um, and the staff is the main person that's going to educate your patients. You can do all the educating in the office, but if you only have a certain amount of time with patients, especially if you schedule on a, you know, 20 minute, every 20 minute basis or so, you're not going to be the one that gets to talk with them about the pricing, um, about when they come back, etc. Or at least if you do, you have to do it really fast. Um, and so the staff is going to be educating your patients on the phone, in the office, after all the appointments. And specialty lens patients do have a lot of questions, especially if they have been fit in specialty lenses or just general contacts in the past, weren't happy, they kind of know the ropes already. Um, they are going to call in with just a lot of questions. And the more that you and your staff know, you know, like, you know, pretty much everything as the doctor, but the more that your staff knows about each thing, the more it instills a confidence in your office. Like these people know what they're talking about and they are really um, the people to take care of me. And I think this is kind of all of what my presentation is about is that you want to be able to have your staff give your patients enough knowledge for them to say, Oh, I could have gone to this, this, this doctor, but I'm coming to this doctor because they really, really know what they're doing. Their staff is very knowledgeable. They know exactly how to help me. Um, 
the more the staff knows, the more the patients trust you. Oh, they've seen this so many times that the front desk knows about what I, what kind of contacts I wear. Um, and I would say for patients calling in or patients that you're going to be having, um, you're going to have about two subsets of patients. One is going to be a patient who is recently diagnosed with something. These are mostly in terms of referrals. Um, this is a patient who was recently diagnosed with a condition, and then they were referred to you for specialty lenses, but they don't really know a lot about their condition. Maybe they were brief, they, they had talked about it briefly with the other doctor, but they're not really sure what they need, and they're not really sure what the process is like because they've never gone through it before. Maybe they just wore soft lenses in the past that weren't really working, um, et cetera. So these patients are going to need your staff to know about their condition, and what kind of lenses do you typically come in for? Um, if you have keratoconus and you're referred to our office, what is keratoconus? And then what types of contact lenses are you usually wearing if you have keratoconus? Um, some type of rigid lens generally. Um, and then educating these patients on, oh, you know, if they ask questions, you usually use a rigid lens with your type of condition. The doctor will Will evaluate you and they'll talk to you more about it um, but this can really help you see and be much better than your glasses just little things like that on the phone really help these patients to feel like oh okay like this i'm in the right place um, and patients who are previously diagnosed these patients are the other subset of patients these patients know what they have they have been through probably different types of contact lenses they've been through surgeries they have a real a real breadth of knowledge that um, if your staff knows nothing about their condition, it's probably gonna not put them at ease. Um, and the more that you know and can say, oh yeah, 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 um, the, the doctor has done many of these, this is what, uh, this is what they, usually, they usually do. Uh, an example is that um, we have some different types of scleral lenses that are offered in our office, um, uh, scan, uh, profilometry based scleral lenses and then we offer a mold or impression based scleral lens um, and these are more for you know patients who um, have had difficulty with sclerals in the past uh, etc um, and so sometimes when patients call in they're like I wear sclerals I'm not happy with the fit my eyes getting my eyes red I can't seem to get rid of it and then um, my staff member on the phone says oh you know we've had patients like that in the past but um, we have tried this type of lens on them, and this is something that's really cool. Um, maybe this would be an option for you. This is what the doctor offers. And then they say, oh, okay. Um, and sometimes she even gives them the link to our website so you can go look up what is she even talking about. And then they say, oh, okay, like there might be something for me here. Um, and then guidance through your process. When you have a patient on the phone, make sure that your staff can guide them through the entire process of what it takes to, to get specialty lenses and kind of what to expect. Um, the education of your staff uh, goes through all of these, these types of things, lens types, the patient experience, if they have keratoconus, they're coming in, what are they gonna be doing on that first exam? Are you gonna be taking um, measurements? Are you going to be um, talking with them about options? Is the doctor going to look at them for how much time? And then what types of ocular conditions do you mainly see? And uh, again, like I said, my staff member is really good at redirecting patients um, to our website in order to show them more information. You can read about this information. Um, and then the last a typical reimbursement amount. So um, Stephanie and I have a have both cash based practices. Um, so this one was really important to me in uh, in starting my practice. I wanted everyone coming in to know approximately uh, exactly how much it would be for the exam, and then approximately how much it would be for lenses, etc. Again, you might not know what lens they need, so you don't have to to add that, but just giving them a, a ballpark. Um, if somebody who is used to just going in for a typical eye exam and now they're coming in for a scleral evaluation, that's gonna be a much higher cost to them. And they might be used to going in and paying nothing or going in and paying like $30 for their copay and then having everything else covered. When as we know, with a lot of medical insurances, et cetera, sometimes it's really hard to get reimbursements for specialty lenses. And so when you don't get anything back and the patient thinks it's going to be covered, there's that disconnect there where they're like, whoa, I'm surprised. And then the sclerals are more expensive than a typical soft lens 
or maybe even just like a, um, a pair of glasses, not always, but um, a pair of glasses. So typical reimbursement amounts uh, is something that you know you can look up beforehand and we'll talk a little bit more about that um but if you do take insurances just kind of have in your staff members mind like what typically does this go for and what typically do you get reimbursed so my tip number one is um fit your staff with specialty contact lenses so if you have staff members that wear contacts um maybe you could fit them with the newest in a scleral, a hybrid, um, a GP lens, even a custom soft lens. Um, this is uh, this is my mother. She helps me out around the office um, throughout the week a little bit, and um, she was really unhappy with her multifocal soft contact lenses, and she's getting really bad dry eye from her glaucoma medication. And so she said, "I said, oh, <laughs> I should just fit you in specialty lenses, which is what I do for." all of my patients. It didn't even occur to me because she's my mom, of course. Um, but I had her, uh, she wanted to try the um, mold-based scleral lenses where it's basically you put a mold in the eye, take out the mold, and then make a scleral lens out of that mold. Um, and so here's her learning how to put on her scleral lenses. And she is doing an okay, she's doing an okay job. Um, and she's a really tough patient. She has a lot of expectations for me. So um, Hopefully this will be great, but when you fit your staff with specialty lenses, then when somebody calls in or when somebody's at the front desk saying, oh, wow, the doctor just got me to 2020 with a, with a specialty lens, I'm so excited, then your staff member sitting up at the front can say, oh, you know what, I actually wear those too. Um, for patients who have a lot of complicated eye problems, to hear that somebody who doesn't have eye problems is also wearing the same type of lens, I think it makes it... Um, a little less daunting for them. Like, oh, I have to have this special lens. And you're like, oh, well, I'm wearing it too. And it's amazing. Um, I wear sclerals myself because of my dry eye. And that's something that I always share with patients. So fit yourself too, if you are interested. Um, I think it's really kind of soothing to patients sometimes to hear that I've been wearing sclerals for forever. Um, it's really fixed my dry eye. Um, especially since I'm really bad with eye drops and warm compresses and all that other stuff. I'm a pretty bad patient, so this is really great for me. Um, and I've had the same pair for like six years, which I should probably get rid of. But um, I, I think it's also helpful for them to hear, oh, the doctors have her pair for this, you know, this amount of time. Maybe this is something that I'm investing in um, and I'm not going to have to switch it out every six months. So my tip number two is create a specialty contact lens manual for your staff. So this is gonna just really jump your staff um, and get them ready to take care of these problems. And the word manual, I think is all very scary because you think of an employee manual that you have to make and it's like 40 pages and it's really boring. Um, and you don't have time as a business owner, you just don't have time to do this stuff sometimes. So um, I'll go through what mine says, but this was pretty much something that I created when I was really quickly hiring somebody, I created it in like two days, maybe one to two days. And they, um, uh, I, I pretty much just word vomited onto a paper. This, these are the things that I'm offering. This is like how my office runs. And then over the years, you know, I've, ref I've been refining it. Um, and so the things that you should include examples, uh, explanations of your lens offering. So what's a scleral, what's a GP, what's um, a hybrid, um, what's a prosthetic and then common conditions that your staff will hear about. So, you know, what's, what's keratoconus, what is a radial keratotomy, what's a transplant and what are those, what lenses do those people typically wear? Um, or even just like astigmatism, like what are the different options for astigmatism? You can have uh, a contact lens with um, multifocal now, and um, you can have a, a specialty soft lens. And then how are patients going to benefit from, from these lenses? So you can share some of the things like these lenses work better than soft lenses because you can achieve better vision, um, et cetera. You can treat dry eye. Um, and then again, putting this in your manual, the, co the approximate cost, and then what to expect for each of these lenses. So what does the appointment time look like? What does that slot <clears throat> look like as well? And I would give this to all of your staff members. I wouldn't just save this for your front desk staff or the people asking, answering the phones, but set, put it, uh, give it to your billing department so that when someone calls in with a billing question, you know they already know what they're talking about. 
um, and then have them read this manual and on their own. And then after they've read the manual, I would have a, a meeting with everybody to go over what types of, um, you know, this is what we're implementing in our office. This is what you've been reading on the manual. Um, you know, talking with them about, about different things that you, you would have um, in your office and answering any questions because they've already read over a lot of the information and hopefully they've looked up a couple of things themselves. Um, but after they've done that, you can give you can give this meeting and then they can answer, you can answer any questions that they have. So this is just screenshot from, from my manual. You'll see it's, it's not perfect. There's probably some typos. Um, I made it really quickly uh, a while ago, but one of the bullet points is these frequently mentioned conditions. So training your staff on what are eye conditions. And this is probably helpful for really any type of eye condition, especially if you have a staff member that doesn't have a lot of experience, they've never worked in the eye care industry before, they don't really know what astigmatism is, or maybe um, when someone calls in for myopia control, they don't know what myopia is, or they've never heard of it in that term before. Um, and so just frequently mentioned conditions is a great thing to add, just so they can um, know what you're talking about. Especially things that are a little bit more niche, like radial keratotomy, it's also called RK. Um, generally, like what kind of lenses would you recommend? And then I have at the end, like what would you, what type of appointment would you schedule them for? And you don't have to have like names for your appointments like I do. You can just say like schedule for 30 minutes or schedule for one hour. And that way they know on the schedule that you don't schedule this person for a 15 minute exam because they're gonna take a lot longer and then you're gonna get backed up. Um, and then I have a, over here like on corneal scarring, they may feel self-conscious, they may want a colored prosthetic option. Um, some patients uh, have visual needs, but they also have other types of needs. And it's not that your, your staff member is going to recommend anything to them, but if the patient calls in saying, um, like we, we have this frequently enough, you know, I, I wear this lens to help me see, but I also want to cover up this thing that I'm seeing on my eye that I'm really self-conscious about. They can say, oh yeah, okay, we have the ability to do these prosthetics um, uh, and, add them to sclerals or, or whatever you may do at your office, but um, just to have an awareness of this is what patients usually go through. And then contact lens, like anything that you have that makes your office unique. Um, maybe you have some really cool topographer or a great OCT. Um, these, again, these are like some different lenses that I have, but there's different types of lenses in general. And to just say, oh yeah, if someone calls in saying, I read about the blah, blah, blah lens on your website. And you can say, oh yes, this is what the, this is what lens we have. Um, especially with the first one, for an example, this is the wave uh, software, which some practitioners use. And then when you have wave, you get these like um, files for patients on their lenses. And so sometimes we'll have patients call in saying, oh, I wear a wave lens. And so you have to have that file. And so you'd have to have that technology to do it. So, you know, it's just some, some things that your staff can kind of know about. Not that they really would do anything with this, except for have that knowledge in case a patient calls in, they can say, oh yeah, I've heard about that. <laughs> um, and uh, I, oh, uh, I put down, this is probably the most important. So if you're not gonna do anything right now, just put down what types of contact lenses that you offer. And then, you know, I just wrote a lot about the, what the lenses are, what do they do? They're a large, like a scleral lens is a large, hard lens. Um, you fill it up with saline, it's really comfortable. Um, you can customize it. How often do the patients come back? Um, how much are they, are they paying for? for? So for three months, like, you know, usually with the lens, a specialty lens will have like a 90 day fitting process, follow-ups, et cetera. Um, and pair of lenses. I mean, again, just approximate pricing, which patients would go through. Or if a patient has like a specific insurance that they're gonna be using, you can say, oh, this, this is like the typical fees. And then your insurance usually covers this amount. Um, nothing is guaranteed, of course, always wanna say that, but um, just something that it's uh, usually you can, you can see this type of reimbursement, et cetera.
And then this is just, again, screenshotted from mine. Yours will look different, but um, frequent doctors to refer. So I have different types of doctors who refer um, to our office for specialty lenses. And, and these, this is their specialty. And so this is what they're generally referring for. So if you hear this, you know, this first name, this is usually a, this is a cornea specialist. So they're usually referring for something like um, specialty lenses. And this doctor prefers he likes scleral lenses a lot, so I did put that on there. But again, scleral lenses are not the end-all be-all. Um, you can really fit the patient with anything. They're just sending them over for a consult. And so, um, and then what type of lens would they be, um, would they be fit for? I think I saw a question um, on uh, the, I think I saw a question that someone had asked about when somebody's referring over for you, uh, to you, um, some doctors are requiring that they have a full, like, like say I would like have a full exam with me in order to fit them with lenses. Um, I don't, I don't do that. I, I'm just, again, like uh, Dr. Kramer was saying, um, I'm just the contact lens doctor for them. So if they've seen this other doctor, I don't need a comprehensive exam. Um, it's not going to be that whole comprehensive fee. And then the specialty lens fitting, it's just going to be a contact lens fitting with this like intake exam. Um, because they've already seen somebody outside. So that's what I do. I mean, again, everybody's office is different, but that's what I do. Um, other things that I have in this, in this manual are um, a phone answering script. So what does my staff member say when somebody calls in? Um, you can put whatever you think would be, would be good. Like, hi, my name is blah, blah, blah. I'm calling, um, how can I help you today? And then the patient would say, Hey, I'm I'm coming in because I heard about these special contact lenses, and I'm, I want to see if they would be helpful for me. And so, your staff member would say, "Oh, okay. Like, um, you know, what uh, what conditions do you have? What doctors referring for you, um, etc." And we'll go over that a little bit more. But um, also in the manual, services offered. So all of our types of exams I put in that manual, um, and I just said. This is a comprehensive exam, and this is what it includes. This is a specialty lens exam. This is a contact lens follow-up. Um, what are they going to include? They're going to include um, all of the imaging that you need. Uh, and if you, you know, bill separately for an exam and a topography, which a lot of offices do, just say, oh, you usually come in for an exam. We usually do a corneal topography. They'll bill the exam, the topography, et cetera. I think having everything up front is really helpful in these cases so that you don't have a lot of tiny line items that you know people are getting billed for again and again and, and they're like oh i don't even know what this is um but having that as an expectation you're going to get this type of imaging and um that's really helpful and then again like not to beat a dead horse but approximate cost of the appointment professional service fees the lenses cost warranty what insurance will and will not pay for um a lot of times when patients call in, they want to know exact exactly what it will cost for certain things, like because they're that second subset of patients. They've already been through sclerals. They've already been through this type of contact lens. They're calling in because they're they're interested in something that you're going to be doing for them. Um, and you know what would uh, what would that look like for them? Um, and you don't have to give exact exacts of course anything could change but just approximately what these people would be uh what these people would be um looking at um and crucial first step the intake phone call this is probably the most important phone call because the patient's usually on the phone for um you know five ten minutes or so setting up an appointment and um your staff member can ask them you know, what, who's referring you? What, um, what conditions do you have? What types of things do you need from us? Um, what are you looking to have? And they'll probably say, oh, I'm looking for contact lenses. I have a corneal transplant. Um, I'm referred by this doctor. And that's why we all add the list of referring doctors, because again, it instills that confidence that, oh, um, this doctor is referring you. Oh, yes, we see, you know, we see their patients. Um, you see their patients often. Oh, I know that doctor. And so they're like, oh, okay, this office is already familiar with my current doctor. Um, if a lot of patients really want you to have the old records, especially specialty lens patients, they do 
love you to have their records um, if they've had like multiple surgeries, different things like that. Um, and so if you can, if you have a relationship with that doctor already where you can just call in and ask for the records, that's always really helpful for them. And they, they feel like they're being taken care of. Um, and then the history, getting this on, having your staff getting the history of a specialty lens patient on the phone call is really great because then you can kind of rule out a lot of different things. So say a patient's been through three types of lenses and then they mention those lenses to you and they're saying, I'm looking for this type of lens or I don't know what's going to help me after this point, but these are the types of lenses that I wear. Then you can say to yourself, oh, okay, they've already tried this lens and hated it. I'm not even going to offer it to them, or I'm just going to briefly mention it as an option, but, um, but you know, they, they don't want it already. So we're not going to go through that. And it'll just save you some time in the, in the office. And then what's their, what's their surgical history? So what is this patient looking at, at in terms of surgeries, a person with two glaucoma surgeries and a corneal transplant in one eye is going to be a much, be a candidate for much different things than somebody who just has like a mild keratoconus or just a dry eye. And that can help you think in your mind before they come in, these are the types of things. So what I'll have my staff member do is I'll just have them input some information into um, the patient's EMR, um, just under this little area that we have for like intra-office notes. And um, it's things that the patient has like freely shared and that they want me to know. Um, and so when they come in, I can say, oh, I've already like heard about you, but like, why don't you tell me um, a little bit about yourself. And I think you already hearing about a lot of the things that they have is helpful to these patients because um, the lenses are, you know, a higher investment than just getting a soft contact lens and a, and a regular exam. Yes, again, insurance slash self-pay slash alternative financing options. I'm noticing that more and more, um, and I'm wondering if this is the same for, for everyone out there, that a lot of patients are coming in and they don't have insurance or they have such high deductibles that nothing is really paid for anyways. So um, communicating the out-of-pocket costs is, is very helpful. As Stephanie said, I'm having a baby um, very soon in a week. And so this is something that I've noticed that other um, doctor's offices have been doing with me lately that I'm actually really liking. I'm self-employed. Um, so usually we're, a, you know, self-pay for our medical coverage. Um, and so they'll call me before, even, you know, if I have a insurance, which I do, and they'll call me and say, oh, hey, we wanted to discuss like your possible out-of-pocket costs before you come in. And they'll say, due to your insurance, it's going to be about this. It's going to be approximately this much. Um, just so you know, you have an awareness of that. And I thought that was like so nice for me to know um, and so helpful just so I'm not going in blind and ending up with a, a bill of X amount of dollars. Um, and it, it just seemed really considerate of the other doctor's offices. And I like to do that as well. And again, a lot of these patients who don't even have insurance or have such a high deductible that it doesn't really make a difference to them, then um, a financing option is really great to communicate with them if they do have that. They're maybe, maybe they're worried about paying for something in your office and you offer some sort of financing. Um, I offer in my office care credit. Um, and I also offer like we did like a little in-house financing program, which you know you can do on on your own and make up whatever works for you. Um, but that's been really helpful because some of these patients, you know, they, I had a patient who just recently lost his job, um, but he really wanted um, these scleral lenses. Um, the, and he was denied from care credit because he doesn't have a job, I'm assuming. And um, so what I did was we set up him up with the in-house financing. And so he still is getting the lenses and he's making payments on them. And he's really happy that this is something that he can, that he can do because you know, he doesn't have insurance and he doesn't have anything else. So this is really a great way for him to still get what he wants um, and, and not feel like he's being put out on, on one exam. So, um, and when you're, when you're setting up this appointment, this is a great thing that I actually heard um, some of the other doctors say as well, but I, I'm always here to help uh, the patient. And as you know, we all are as doctors. So if, my staff members on the phone with the patient and um, specifically for my office, if they're concerned about, oh, you know, I really did want to use my insurance. We're going to, we give them all the information about our office, you know, what they would expect if they come in. Um, and then if they say, I really want to use my, see if I can use my insurance, 
then we always refer them to doctors in the area that do accept insurance or maybe, um, you know, it doesn't feel like that patient's going to be a good fit for your office. Um, you know, you can always refer them to another doctor. Oh, I, I know these doctors, they're good. They also do specialty lenses. Maybe they can help you out. And then I always add just like, we're always here for you if you need anything, anything different. Um, you know, we're always here for you, but, but try out these doctors and, and let us, you know, let us know how it goes because um, we really want them to be successful. This is something that's been discussed, uh, verbiage, over the last, um, you know, few years, but always, uh, it's pretty much been discussed always, about when your staff member's on the phone or you're using it in your office, do you call things certain, uh, certain um, do you use certain words because it's going to communicate value better? Um, so fitting fee has been something that's been discussed for a really long time that we shouldn't call it a fitting fee. It doesn't sound, um, it doesn't sound like all the, all the time and effort and um, everything that you put into your practice it, to just like fit a contact lens. It just doesn't sound as good. And, but some people think it sounds fine. So really this stuff is all up to you. Um, I like the term professional service fee, especially with specialty lenses, because it does incorporate like a good amount of time, your initial intake exam generally, um, three months of follow-ups. Again, it kind of depends on how your business is run, but um, professional service fee really communicates to the patient that like that's them paying for your professional opinion and your time. Um, and so anytime they're in the office with you, which could be unlimited for the next three months, then that's what they are, that's what they're paying for, that's what they're investing in. Instead of just a fitting fee, which is like, oh, I fit you with a contact and and then, you know, I, I don't know, I think it, it, I think that sounds a little bit better. But again, I call some things fits as well. So I kind of go back and forth, but this is what's on all my documents. Um, and then if you're having a specialty lens patient in for the first time, do you call something an exam or do you call it a consultation? I liked the first exam for me to be called consultation. I think Stephanie does this as well. Um, I liked it to be called consultation because not only if you're doing specialty lenses, you, you know what you're talking about. They're paying for your expertise and they're coming in and seeing you because you have a special niche, right? Um, they're not just getting a, a general exam. They're, they're talking to you about what they need. And sometimes patients uh, don't really know what's out there. And so they'll come in and see you and they won't necessarily even um, go through with any lenses. They'll just, you know, see what your opinion is and, and then go from there. Sometimes you can find these specialty lens patients that are 2020, but they're still like, can I get that 2020 plus? And they have keratoconus and all these different things. And so you just talk with them about what their options are. Um, and sometimes because they're 2020, they, they don't even do anything, but the consultation is like, they're consulting you as a professional. And so I like to use that for the first exam, um, for the first uh, exam, like I said, but, <laughs> um, and then investment versus expense. So these lenses are generally pricier. Obviously they last a lot longer than soft contact lenses. If you're getting like a rigid lens, it will last you probably longer. Um, and just saying it is like, this is an investment. It's like the first time that you're being um, evaluated for these lenses. Um, and instead of calling it like expense or expensive, especially with your staff members um, to not refer to it like that, just to say like, this is all the things that you get. This is like the lens, it's really great. It includes all of these things. Um, I like the, uh, the term investment better because that's really what they're doing is they're investing in their, their health of their eyes, their vision, um, a product that's going to last them a long time. And then I love the word um, designing as well. I use this a lot in my practice. Um, you're not just ordering a lens uh, and looking at a lens and ordering it. You're, you're designing it. You have knowledge in your head that you got from school, from going to lectures, um, from seeing your patients, from having experience. You know what to do with these patients and you know how to alter the lenses to, be, to fit around their eyes. You're not just, you know, you're not just fitting a lens. You're not just looking at it but you're really designing something that's going to be customized to their eye. Uh, and that's, that's a great thing for them to hear because that, you know, when they leave the office, you're not just done. You still have to go in and may, you know, design the lens, call the lab, talk with them. It takes a long time. And, and um, 
that's, I think, really important. And then communicating the value to these patients by using this verbiage and also communicating the value to your staff members of, you know, this is a more, um, you know, this is more of an, like, say you're getting a scleral lens, it's more of an investment, but look at all the great stuff it's, it, it can do. It gives people better vision with better comfort, et cetera, and um, share the success stories. We have a lot of patients leave the office and share with um, my front desk, oh my gosh, I can see so much better. I'm like so happy. Like these are amazing. And for them to hear that, that's really great because then they can communicate that on the phone with prospective patients. Like, wow, yeah, we just had a patient in with, um, you know, who's very happy with this. Obviously not sharing any personal details, but, um, you know, just sharing the success stories so that your staff knows like what cool things these, these lenses can be and what you can do with them. Um, and then how the design process works, communicating this with your staff as well. Like after I see a patient and I'm designing something for them, it does take me like 30 minutes to an hour to design something and like get it in my head, order it, um, put it into the system. Like that takes a long time. And then communicating the value too of like how long do the lenses last? A lot of times if you're purchasing a scleral lens or a, a GP lens and it's a higher cost than a soft lens, they're going to think, oh, okay, I need to replace this every three months, but that's obviously not the case. Um, and so having your staff know these things and be able to communicate that with them is really helpful. And, and then they kind of get like, oh, wow, I'm getting like so much for, um, for what I'm doing. And then this is another picture of that cute patient who said I could use her pictures. Um, this is uh, during the fitting process. What can your staff do? Basically anything. Um, anything that you want them to do. So if you have a technician that works up your patients, that gets imaging for you, um, they can do all of that. Inserting lenses, the most important or the, the best that's going to help you is the insertion removal training. So that's like the number one I would recommend to start doing uh, or training your staff in because that takes up so much of your time. And I'm sure that not a lot of doctors with uh, larger practices are doing the insertion removal training themselves, but when you introduce something new like this, you're going to have to retrain your staff. So that's the first thing that I would do. Um, but your staff can really do do anything. So say they get a, they have a patient in um, and they image them and they say, oh, this this looks like, you know, the patient said they had keratoconus. This looks like keratoconus. Um, they can also choose which which lens to um, to use on them. Like maybe you said this patient, I think they're going to need sclerals. Um, or I think they're going to need a GP and then having a sticky note on your machine to say, okay, HVID between this and this, this is the diameter of lens you use. Or if the K's are this, you choose a lens with this and then they can pop those on the eyes for you. Um, again, this is going to take a lot of, of training for, for your staff, but if you have a, a system that you use in order to choose the first lens that you put on, then you can just put that little, put a little sticky note on your on your machine and then the, pay, the staff member can just look at it, choose a lens, put it on, and then you can get the, um, you can get all that data. Um, and even if you are the one that picks out the first lens, which sometimes doctors like to do, especially since, you know, you never know what you're going to want to use. Um, and and you, sometimes you talk to the patient first um, about the different options, but imaging with the lenses on is something that a lot of staff members do. Um, and this next slide is going to show you what I think is going to save you a lot of time. So this is what I use in my office. This is a scleral lens design form. Um, and this is, this is basically to just save you some time. So, okay, you have an OCT um, and you want to be, you want your staff member to go and take the patient with the lenses with an OCT. doesn't matter what type of lens they are, but mostly you're going to be using it for sclerals. So that's just why I put this here. Again, I don't always do sclerals, but that's just kind of what's on top of mind. Um, but you're going to look at the, the lenses are going to be on the patient. You're going to do an assessment. You're going to say, okay, these are the areas that I think are concerning edge like this one. I put edge and then this one, I just circled it and put close. So the lens is riding close to the eye. So that staff member is going to take that piece of paper and they're going to image those two areas and then they're going to give those images back to you. Saves a lot of time instead of having the staff member go in the back and image everything, image the central clearance, image the, the, the superior, the inferior. Um, just instead of doing everything, it's going to save you time. And I mean, <clears throat> if you're evaluating them in your slit lamp, what's the difference between 300 microns of clearance and 250? Like if you know that it's good, you don't really need to image that. You can kind of just ballpark that. It's not going to make a huge difference in terms of your fitting. 
Um, and after the exam, the handoff is a great, um, a great way to, again, communicate a lot of value to your patients and really take care of them and, and make sure that they feel taken care of. Um, so when they come out, hopefully they'll, their vision will have improved a little bit and they'll be like, wow, my vision improved. Um, this is really, this is really cool. Like, what do I do next? Um, so having your staff member be able to say, oh, you were fit with lenses. Usually our next steps are, you know, we're going to order a lens for you. You're going to come back in three weeks. Um, or like we're going to bill your insurance once they get back to us, then we're going to order the lens and then we'll schedule you for like six weeks from today and then we'll be in contact with you, you know, kind of whatever your office does. Um, and then ways to take payment, um, scheduling, you know, scheduling the next appointment. And then what should they expect in terms of if they're doing the financing option, when do you have them back? When do you order lenses versus the insurance timeline? When does insurance usually get back to us? Um, or do you order them lenses that day and bill insurance that same day? And then it's, it's um, all taken care of. And um, sometimes patients need time to decide with specialty lenses because they are a, a bigger investment of like, <clears throat> do I want to go with a GP or do I want to go with a hybrid lens? I, I don't know. I'm, I've tried both on at the exam and I, I'm going to think about it and just decide kind of which one's for me because the GP is a little bit less expensive, but I could feel it under my upper lid and, um, you know, just maybe they're thinking things to themselves and they're not ready. And that's totally fine. Um, we encourage you to think about what option you want. Um, and uh, just having a timeline, we always say to our patients who are deciding on what they want to do, oh, we're going to have um, our, our receptionist is going to reach out to you in about a week just to see like where you're at, just to kind of make sure we don't, um, we don't miss out any questions. Um, and then they'll call in a week and then say, oh, hey, like, did you decide on like, do you want to do anything? You want to move forward with like a certain lens? Um, and then that way you can just, they make sure that they feel like they're taken care of, but they also feel like you're still on the ball with their, their treatment. Um, and that's, uh, I think they feel really nice about doing that. Sometimes if it's a patient who is going through the specialty lens process too, and I have specific questions I needed to ask, I'll just write them in a, um, my staff and I share a Google calendar. And so I'll write them in the Google calendar and I'll just put like on this day, I just put like follow up with the, this like patient initial, you know, initials. Um, and they kind of know who I'm talking about so they can just give them a quick call. And that's, that's nice for helping to schedule. And then paperwork to help the business run smoothly. Um, having as many things written out as possible is the number one piece of advice that I could give a practice, especially a busy practice, um, trying to introduce specialty lenses and have it be successful. And so you don't feel like, wow, this is, this is too much. It's too many questions. It's taking up a lot of my time. Because if you're seeing 40 patients a day, um, which you know I think we've all done, it is really hard to field all the questions during the day and still help have things run smoothly, especially if, you know, the patients do have a lot of questions about these lenses and these patients do tend to be a little bit more high need than um, just a typical glasses and contacts um, comprehensive exam patient. So anything that you can write down and you can give to your staff so they can share with the patient um, is really is really helpful as well. Um, the advanced beneficiary notice is something, these are all things that you can look up online, um, especially with the GPLI website. Um, great, great resource. Um, but this is something that you give to your patients to say, we're going to bill your insurance, but if your insurance doesn't cover something, then you are responsible for, if, if you want to go through with lenses, that you're responsible for like this amount, the, the rest of the amount. And you have to get that on the day of their um, first fit um, in order to have it be um, used later. At least that's how it was done when I was when I was when I was doing it. So um, I don't think anything's changed. But um, the specialty contact lens agreement is great and something that everybody should definitely have. This is probably like the what like one of the most important, if not the most important, piece of paper that you'll have in your office. Um, I'll go through it and, and on the next slide. And then payment options. Um, Oh, I thought I had my little sheet with me here. Payment options is great because sometimes patients come out and they're like, oh, how do I, you know, how do, what do I, what do I do next? And then I have a piece of paper that says like, these are the cards we accept. We can accept HSA or FSA. These are the financing options that we have. Like 
if you're interested in like a little explanation, so maybe they can just look down the paper and say, oh, okay, um, this is what I'm gonna be doing if they're not using their insurance. If they're using their insurance, obviously you would talk to them about that. And um, again, hopefully look it up beforehand about kind of what they might expect. So this is my specialty lens agreement. Um, I was uh, going through this for this uh, presentation and realized that I spelled warranty wrong for the last year and a half. So I don't know how that happened, um, <laughs> but I did, I did fix it. So my professional, and this is like professional service fee includes the warranty of the lenses, refunds, and then um, generally you'll throw in something here like exclusions for medical issues unrelated to contacts. So if the patient has a retinal detachment and they come in and see you and it's not related to their contacts, it's obviously not going to be in the, the, 30 like the 90 day um follow up but you know just uh just let them know that and if 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 like my office you have a big um referral network they probably like i always say you know i'm going to send you back you were sent by a specialist i'm going to just send you back to that if you have any issues with the lenses obviously call me but if it's unrelated to the lenses you can go see your other doctor as well and you probably would you wouldn't see me um just because you don't want to take that that business away from the other doctor um, like we were saying with the referral relationship. Um, and here's what you put on your specialty lens agreement, professional service fee, the timeline, how, how much time do you include in this? Um, sometimes depending on insurances, sometimes what you'll, you'll do is you will bill them every time they come in. That's usually with like a medical insurance. I think it's Medicare something or other. Um, and uh, lens costs. Um, because I do different types of, of, of scleral lenses, what I actually did was I wrote two types of professional service agreements. And then I um, had one for sclerals and then I had one for regular lenses or, or you know, kind of all different types of lenses. So one, I have a free page. So I'll put on there, professional service fee is X amount of dollars. Um, lens cost is X amount of dollars. And then the one with the with the scleral lenses, because I have those different levels of sclerals, I put all of the, the pricing on there. And then when their patient's in the office, I circle the ones that I think would be appropriate for them. And then they can decide on, do I wanna go with a conventional lens or do I wanna go with a mold-based lens? The prices are different. Um, both, we, we can probably get them to a great result. Um, but I do give them that option. I'll just circle it. And sometimes they call me and say, oh, I decided I want this one. Um, and then that's that's what we do. So um, the refund policy is a great thing to have on there in case the patient, um, you know, wants, they don't end up liking their lenses and they want to want a refund. Obviously, you hope that this doesn't happen in it. Rare, I would say it rarely does. But um, I had my first, I've had my first refund the other day because the woman just tried the lens and we were, it was the first lens she tried. We just had to make a prescription adjustment. That was it. Um, but she said it was giving her headaches and she had been through so much with her eyes that I think at that point in time, she was just she was really tired. And I said, please just give it one more time. Like it doesn't cost us anything to just get the other lens. Like, let's just do it. And she was like, I, I can't like psychologically, she just could not try it again. Um, and so that was fine. She knew the policy um, and then get their signature, scan it into your system, et cetera. Um, and I think we're almost, we're almost nearing the end. Um, and so what do I do first? Um, first manual, get everything written down, what types of lenses you offer, cost, what patients would expect, give the document to your staff to read. Again, you can do this on like a weekend, you're in front of the TV, just write it all out really quickly. You can give it to them and adjust later. Um, and then what do you do next? Train your technicians and um, front staff for the billing portion of it. GPLI has amazing resources for all things coding. Stephanie Wu has amazing billing and coding resources as well. She made um, a webinar. I mean, I think I watched this like three or four years ago that I think is really still very relevant. And you can find that it's, it's on there. I, I think she can probably tell you where it is, but amazing resource. So everything is online for you to help you with this and how to do it correctly so that you, you have the help that you need. And let the people know, get out there, get it on your website, social media, Instagram, Facebook, Google My Business, super underutilized resource for you, um, which is really helpful for getting that SEO. And then information in the office, your staff can hand out information to patients. Oh, maybe you try this lens um, next time. This is the lenses that we offered so patients can read it. And uh, 
thank you so much for joining us today. This was really fun. If you have any questions, we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, but our next event, Stephanie's going to talk about right now, just so you can join us for that. Well, thanks, Dr. Morrison. That was such an amazing presentation, and you've got to be so proud of yourself for accomplishing so much in such a small amount of time. And and I remember when we first chatted, you know, you were going to do like comprehensive exams and glaucoma and this and that and specialty lenses. And it just seems like exponentially you have grown into uh, like just a specialty lens clinic, which is, is super exciting. And um, yeah, like Dr. Morrison said, we do have another presentation coming up with the immediate past president of the Scleral Lens Society, Dr. Karen Lee, who is also a good friend. She is an incredible speaker very, very smart. I'm, I am super excited to hear from her. And there was um, a few comments in the chat box that came through about scleral lens filling solutions. And she's going to be going over all of that. I think it's time for an update. There's a lot of new products on the market and, uh, and different things. So this will be an incredible uh, event. If you have a smartphone, you can just scan the QR code right now to register right away. And then Taylor also put in the registration link. So you can just click on that and register if you have any interest. So this will conclude the formal three hour CE event. So if you need to hop off and get on with, with your day, it was wonderful being together. Thanks for joining. But we are going to stay on Dr. Fergrozo, Dr. Morrison and Dr. Kramer and I to answer a few questions. And, and we do have a lot that came in. So Thank you guys so much. You know, it's just fun to see all, all, all three of you guys just having incredible practices and just kind of, we all came from different walks of life and different paths and went to different schools and, and kind of ended up doing specialty lenses. So very, very proud, proud of you all. And it's such a pleasure that you guys are, are spending your Sunday morning with, with me and all of our attendees. So I think I'll just ask each of you guys questions that came in during each exam chat. So I'll just direct the question to each person. And then of course, if there's anybody else that wants to chime in, uh, feel free. Uh, so Dr. Kramer, question came in for you as far as at what stage of dry eye syndrome do you recommend scleral lenses? So I think uh, one thing that is important is determining what type of dry eye you're dealing with. I think that's probably the key in determining the treatment because the treatment won't be the same um, depending on, you know, whether it's evaporative, whether it's tear film deficiency or whether it's a combination and that's you know that you can do through testing and uh, questionnaires and and different tests in the office and i think that regardless of the type of contact lens that you are prescribing uh, you need to make sure that your ocular surface that the patient's ocular surface can tolerate the lens and what i mean by that is that you have to take care of basic things such as eyelid hygiene, such as um, making sure that there is a adequate tear film, um, that the patient is doing any meibomian gland treatment if needed. So I think that's initial. And then of course, if they have any sort of ocular surface irritation, corneal staining, um, or conjunctival staining, at that point, I do recommend a scleral lens. But if it's mostly evaporative, and I think that with my Bohmian gland treatments and eyelid hygiene alone, I could treat it, then I probably wouldn't recommend a scleral lens. So just to summarize, I think the scleral lens is useful when you do have, when your ocular surface is compromised, um, uh, and that would be with corneal and or conjunctival staining. Excellent. Thank you so much. And um, there's a lot of questions that came in asking to see examples of our contracts, uh, a lot of questions about Dr. Morrison's staff manual, uh, some of our specialty lens agreements. What are we, what are we asking the patients to sign? And um, there is actually a ton of those that are uploaded on the business of scleral lens Facebook page. Uh, Taylor, if you can put that link in the chat box right now, I think it's like facebook.com slash business of scleral lenses. I think that's what it is. Um, 
But Taylor, if you can put that in, in case people wanted to check that out, but that's a great resource because in the files section of that group, there's, there's everything. There's, there's examples of, of people's contracts, of people's um, pricing as far as like uh, how to write it out and kind of fill in the blanks and things like that. So that's an excellent resource uh, as well. So there's a lot of questions on that. So I just wanted to make sure to get that out there. A uh, question for Dr. Fergrozo, when fitting a lens based off of K's, what is your method on what lens to start with? So um, if, if a patient has a lot of astigmatism, I'll just go to my best fit sphere on my topography or just use sim K's um, is, is how I do it. A lot of times if it's an, a normal cornea, you could just look at it and then, you know, based on the K's, you can design the lens right then and there. Um, based on keratometry, you could just go half a flat, half a diopter flat or half a diopter steeper, depending on what you want to look at or what, what, what you want the lens to look like. Um, but if you're, if you're wanting the a best fit corneal, spherical corneal GP lens, if you go on your topography and stick and, and put it on elevation, it will give you the BFS or be, best fit sphere. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Morrison you mentioned in-house financing. What happens when patients blow you off and they don't make their payments anymore? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it doesn't matter because um, I charge for um, my initial consultation fee. It's That one is non-refundable. Um, and then the remainder, which would be the professional service fees and the cost of lenses, I order lenses when the patient's at 75% payment. Um, and then the patient can come in, we can start the fitting process, but I do, I do not dispense anything until hundred percent is paid in full. Um, That's a great so, tip because yeah. I think, I mean, for sure myself, I've been burned where I dispensed the lenses and they were going to pay like a certain amount per month. And then guess what happened? They never paid at all. <laughs> so I learned really early on in my career to not do that. So that's what, that's what I do personally. I know there are some doctors that they'll, They'll dispense the lenses once like a certain amount is paid. But um, for me, I just think, you know, until you have the funds, uh, we can't proceed with dispensing the lenses. And that's just, and yeah, I think it's, that's a great, great pearl. Dr. Morrison, thank you so much. Um, the, uh, there's a, a question from somebody that wants to know what EHR all of us uses. So uh, why don't I start with you, Dr. Kramer? Yeah, um, I use one that is not optometry specific. It's called Practice Fusion. And for a while it was free. So that was great when I was starting my practice out. Um, but then they started charging and understandably so. But what I really like about it is that there's a lot of free text. And I found personally that um, a lot of the optometry, and it could have changed over the last few years, but um, when I was starting out, especially a lot of the optometry uh, EHR systems were not compatible with the type of work I was doing, which is specialty lenses. Again, it could have evolved, but since I've become so comfortable with practice fusion, um, I've stuck to it. So I just have templates that I use and it allows me to do a lot of free typing. So I really, really like it a lot. Awesome. What about you, Dr. Fergroso? Uh, I use Revolution EHR. Um, we, we had Crystal to start off with, but since we do a lot of medical and vision plans, what I really re like about Revolution EHR is that it, it incorporates um, a lot of the the history so that it, it makes it so that it's, it's difficult to not fill in. So when you when you're auditing, getting audited, everything is already auto populated in the correct place. Um, the, the, it does have a contact lens um, portion, which is which is sufficient. Um, we, we, we make it work. Um, but I, I chose this EHR uh, mostly because I, my practice bills medical and vision plans. Thank you, Dr. Morrison. Uh, Dr. Wu and I use the same EHR. I both use I trust, which is I is in uh, letter I and then trust. Um, and it was newer. I think it just came out maybe a few years ago or something. Um, and, uh, it's, it works well. Um, 
you know, you have pluses and minuses to everything, but yeah, I think it works. I think it works relatively well and hasn't given me really too many issues. Great. Thank you. Uh, for Dr. Dr. Kramer, how do you pick a diagnostic fitting set and how many fitting sets do you need in order to be successful with specialty lenses? Great question. So I have a lot of fitting sets, uh, different ones, um, but I only really use two or three. And I don't believe that you can be a jack of all trades because honestly, I just think that the, the better you get with one or two sets, the better you're going to be because there are so many uh, intricate differences and, and little, um, I guess, quirks and features to every type of design that if you use too many, you won't really ever be an expert at one. So what I recommend a new practitioner, uh, scleral lens practitioner, of course, is to pick one or two to start and maybe add a third one later on and to really learn everything there is to know about those. You really only need one, uh, but I, I recommend to have two like go-tos and that's what I've been doing. And um, I, I think it's brought a lot of success because I feel extremely comfortable uh, with those two or three fitting sets that I use. Excellent. I love that advice. I think that a lot of doctors always want to know like how many they should get. And it's really good to get started with, with one that you're, that you could get real comfortable with before you get like 50 different fitting sets that can become incredibly exhausting. Uh, Dr. Fergrozo, what is the average startup cost for private practice to implement specialty contact lenses? So, uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I, I think if you want, really want to start, you don't, you don't need um, all of the, the fancy tools and gadgets. They're nice to have, but I, I often actually don't, don't need them to do my diagnostic fitting. I'm, I'm a lot like Dr. Kramer is that I have actually one, maybe two go-to fitting sets. I have a lot of fitting sets, but I only use um, one or two. And this actually increases efficiency because you learn how to use them quicker. Um, and you learn all the little nuances. Even if you see something that's suboptimally fit, you know exactly how to manipulate the curves that you don't need to, you know, um, you know, go to another lens or you don't necessarily need to, you know, ask a consultant or, or use an instrument to try to try to figure it out is that you you've learned all the nuances. And so you can you can streamline the fit just by using your, um, you know, your, your thought process because you've learned how to work so intimately with with that with that lens. Um, that's actually how uh, we fit in our practices. I have a one go to lens. And if it doesn't work, then I'll go to a second second lens or, or, or use my technology. But I would say on probably 95% of my patients, we use the exact same brand and that increases um, efficiency. And with respect to, you know, having to invest into the, um, the, the investment is that the fitting sets, a lot of companies want to work with you is that, you, you know, you can, you can try to get a fitting set. If you promise that you're going to fit several lenses is that they, you can use um, it's, it's a fit to fit to own. And so really just owning a fitting set, I don't think, and, and a slit lamp, of course, technology is nice, but you, you really, you really don't, don't need it. Um, if you're building, you know, of course, medical and vision plans, the bare minimum is that you, on, when you're working with irregular corneas is that you have to have at least topography. If you're working with a patient who has a thinning disorder of the cornea a pack would be good to, to hold up your, 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 um, your diagnosis in, in the case of audit. So, you know, having those two instruments, um, you know, a pachymeter, a pachymeter, and then also a topography. And then if you get your fitting set for free or not free, I'm sorry, if you, if you fit it to, to own it, <laughs> then, then that's, those are the initial investments. Yeah, that's great advice. Uh, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, Dr. Morrison, should you charge one fee for everything? And I think they're saying like, it's a global fee for the, the fitting, the service fee, the material fee, or should you split it up into exam for one fee and the scleral lenses for one fee? Oh, um, like, should you combine professional service fee and, and the lens cost together? 
I think it sounds like this practitioner is kind of saying like, this is just what the fee is for everything. And, but maybe it's better to split it up uh, into two different sections. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can really do it however you want, but I, I do split it up between professional and then the cost of the lenses, which I think most people do. Um, one of the reasons is just because if you do offer a refund, what are you going to refund out of a global fee? Um, and your time's already, say you've already spent all the time with the patient, you've seen them four times and the fit is final. And then, you know, a month later, they're like, oh, I'm not really wearing them. Can I, ref can I refund them? Or can I exchange something? Then I don't know what you would um, go back to in terms of, in terms of that. That's why I have the, I, that's why I have them split up. I think if you're taking insurance, you do have to have them split up. So I think that's something that you will need to do. But if you're not taking insurance and you can do it however you want, but I would, I would still, I would still split it. I think that I tend to um, also put more of an emphasis on professional services being the most important thing. And then lenses being um, just, you know, something that you're, that you're buying. Um, because I think that, you know, what, what people really need is your expertise and your time. And that's the most important thing. And that's the most expensive thing that they're going to be um, making that investment in, not just oh, I purchased a lens and then this is what I got. Like, that's really what, that's really what's most important is like your professional expertise. Great. Uh, Dr. Kramer, can you bill scleral prophylometry? Uh, huh. I mean, you can bill it maybe as topography. Um, and I think, yeah, you can, you can definitely export it and, and show insurance companies that uh, you've done because it does have corneal elevation as well as scleral um, elevation topography. Uh, so yeah, I guess you can. Um, I have a topographer as well. So I think that's a little bit more uh, kind of standard. Uh, but yeah, you can you can use a scleral profilometer um, and build that if you're talking about to the patient. Um, that's already incorporated into the out of pocket costs when I do uh, you know, a consultation for like a self pay patient. So it's already kind of built into the consultation fee. Um, but if you are talking about insurance companies, um, can, if you do it instead of a corneal topography, then yes, um, I assume that you can. Thank you. And last question, I'd love to hear from all three of you. So I guess I'll start with uh, Dr. Kramer and then we'll work our way down the line. But how do you handle maternity leave? You know, you and Dr. Kramer and Dr. Fergoso both have uh, children and Dr. Morrison is about to. But since this is something that you only do maybe in your practice, maybe you're the only doctor that does it. Uh, so Dr. Kramer, uh, any advice? Well, um, I'm not exactly the typical uh, person. <laughs> I actually went back to work like three days after giving birth. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously part-time. Um, I think one of the advantages of having your own practice and all of us have our own practice is that you can really make your own schedule. And I think that's a huge advantage. So, you know, if you just want to work in the morning and bang out like eight patients and then go back and breastfeed, like do that, you know what I mean? I just think that um, it, it's up to you uh, as, a, as a practice owner. And when you are specialized in, in contact lenses and you do have your own like sub practice in someone else's practice or you have your own um, private practice, like you really have a lot of freedom. Um, I think that uh, it's important to take the time that you need uh, to take care of yourself, to take care of your baby. Um, but I personally am just a person who needs to work and I made it work. And I think everyone will have their own individual way of doing it. And I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I just think that the sooner you can get back, uh, the sooner you're going to have kind of a normal life again. So that's what I recommend. Thanks, Dr. Kramer. Dr. Fergoso? Yeah. So when I bought the practice, I was actually 20 weeks pregnant with, with my daughter, Teal. And I, I took basically the same approach Dr. Kramer did is that I had a C-section. I would have gone back to work sooner, but I, I waited a week and a half. 
And then I, I saw patients um, because I, I was the only doctor there. Um, we weren't quite as busy when we first started. So Teal was in exam lane two and I was seeing patients, you know, in exam lane one. And I just, I just made it work. Um, and, it, you know, again, you do what's best for you, but I felt the need to, to go back um, to see, to see my patients and, and I, I like working. So I, I went right back in, even though I was supposed to wait six weeks. Amazing. And Dr. Morrison, what are you, what are your plans? So like Dr. Fergoza, I'm also having a C-section. Uh, um, it was scheduled a little earlier than I thought I was going to be having my baby. Um, and so I, uh, I originally had taken four weeks that I was just going to close the practice and then come back. Um, and now that I'm having her a little bit earlier, um, it's going to be about six weeks. Um, so I am just closing my practice. Um, I, I function pretty independently. Um, I didn't, I don't have a lot of, st like, I don't have a huge staff to pay or anything like that. So, um, I, it was really, I could do that. I didn't have like four other people working for me. Um, and, um, so I'm going to come back in, in six weeks and just start seeing patients again. And if I, if, if I feel like coming back sooner then I will, and, um, I have some doctors that I set up to take care of patients if they have emergencies. And, um, I put like a little thing together for my receptionist cause she's, you know, still going to be answering phones and answering questions. So yeah, it's hard to find information on what other practice owners have done with their, with their practices. I originally had scheduled to come back with them like you know, two to three weeks and everyone told me I was crazy, but you know, everyone here has obviously done it. So I think it'll be fine. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you all for sharing, sharing that. That's so interesting. And just goes to show you that just kind of everybody practices their own way. And, and, uh, you guys, you, you are all so incredibly amazing. And, uh, I just wanted to end with a, a comment that's in the question and answer box. That's uh, says from Annie it says, not a question, but OMG, you ladies are amazing. I am so excited to hopefully make some small changes that will lead to a much happier practice. And I feel like that really sums up this, this series. And I just wanna say thanks to Dr. Morrison, Dr. Fergrozo and Dr. Kramer for, for your efforts and in, in sharing all of this incredible knowledge and, and expertise with our listeners. Thank you to Taylor for doing all the administration and behind the scenes, everything. Thank you so much for getting all of this approved and for being here today. And of course, thank you to Ursula from Wink for making this production happen. So thank you so much, everybody. We hope to see you at the next event. Please feel free to reach out to us if we didn't answer your questions and, and we'll get to them as soon as we can. Thank you so much and have a nice Sunday. Bye. Right, bye.